like to call the meeting to order for November 10th, 2020. Please stand for the invocation by Mr. Salazar. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. Thank you, Mr. Salazar. Fire evacuation, there's two exits to the chambers, one behind us, behind here to the rear of the chambers, down the stairs and out to the parking lot or to my left, your right, and down the, to your left, and down the rear stairs to the parking lot. Can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Salazar? Here. Mrs. Thurston? Here. Mr. Ungeyer? Here. Mrs. Hall? Here. Mr. LeBlanc? Here. Mrs. LeBlanc? Here. Mr. Ryder? Here. Chairman Cruzel? Here. Thank you. Thank you all for being present. Uh, number six, board guests, we have none. Number seven, superintendent's report. Mr. Dresick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, there was a reminder that all Enfield Public Schools buildings um, and schools will be closed tomorrow, Wednesday, November 11th, for observation of Veterans Day. Uh, I sent a note out to staff today where I have the authority to instruct them to unplug tomorrow um, the best they can as well as I can't instruct students to do it, but I think everybody has a well-deserved break and to take the day to remember what the day, the purpose of the day is. Um, and that's the, as Mr. Salazar put, um, to recognize and remember those who, who have given the ultimate sacrifice for us to be able to sit in a room like this here this evening. But I will say this, and I say this every year around Veterans Day, um, if you do come across a woman or a man in uniform, not just tomorrow, but any day of the year, um, it's never a bad idea to say thank you. So if I reiterate that annually, but if any time you have an opportunity to see someone, whether you're in line at the gas station or in a grocery store, um, you're never doing the wrong thing if you think, think an active service member or a veteran. So thank you all for what you've done and what you continue to do. Um, I also have an update that just came in um, regarding our partnership with ERFC. Some of you may have heard this at last night's council meeting. Um, but our educational resource for children, our before and after school program, had to make some adjustments um, due to the circumstances that we're dealing with. Um, so all before and after school learning centers, um, of the effective this Friday, are gonna transition to the distance learning center at the Enfield Annex. So the individual before and after school programs in the schools are all gonna be shifted over to the distance learning center um, because of the numbers um, and their enrollment and, and you know, given the circumstances with the amount of kids that we have on distance learning and the amount of kids who are on hybrid, um, it, just was, it wasn't sustainable for Claire to operate all of the individual centers at the current time. They're not permanently closing. This is a temporary move under the circumstances that we're in. All the families have been notified. And in addition, as, the, as being a partner with them, because we've transported kids from, in, in, especially siblings from one building to the next for before and after school care. Um, we're gonna continue to transport those children um, to the distance learning center at the annex to assist those families to have one pickup and one drop off location um, for their children. So beginning Monday, November 16th, all students enrolled in EFRS, ERFC centers uh, will be bused to the distance learning center after school. And there's more information on the ERFC website. Uh, this just came through a few minutes ago and I'll make sure we get it up on our website as well. And I'll share it with Scott so you could put on the PTO website if you wouldn't mind. Um, but that that was something that's been in the works for a little while um, because of the, the arrangement that 
Claire has with the town. There had to be an adjustment at the council meeting last night, but that's, that is form, that is official right now. Um, and last thing before I get into the update, um, last week we lost one of our own. And some of you may have heard um, last week, tragically, we lost a longtime Enfield educator uh, for over 30 years, Lisa Dupuy, who spent the majority of her career teaching kindergarten and most notably and recently at Hazardville Memorial School. And I know Mr. Ryder probably have some, some comments during, during his, his time this evening, so I don't want to impede on any of his remarks, um, but I just want to take an opportunity to share something that I, I experienced today. And I had a, a, an opportunity today to take part in a celebration of Lisa's life, and I'll, albeit it was a, for a brief period of time, um, I did have the opportunity to meet her family, her husband Michael and, and her daughters Carly and Emily. Um, and both, all of them went out of their way to make sure that I knew um, that their mom and his wife loved nothing more than being a teacher, particularly being a teacher here in Enfield. So I've often said this, and I'll say it again. Um, you know, there's an immediate family that's grieving right now, but there's an extended, at times, dysfunctional family that is equally as grieving right now. So I ask all of you if you can keep Lisa and and her family, and her entire Enfield Schools fam, public schools family, uh, in your thoughts as everyone tries to cope with this tremendous loss. And lastly, I'm going to go on to the our update. And the update is gonna look similar to what I've shared with you over the past couple of meetings. Um, identical to what I've shared the last couple of meetings, there's a few tweaks that I've made this week um, to help better answer some of the questions that some of you have presented to me, uh, in addition to questions that I've received from the public. So the first has not changed, that's the original uh, infamous color-coded sheet from the State Department of Ed and DPH guidelines. Um, that was the original chart, the color-coded chart from yellow to orange to red. That was based on the leading indicators on a seven-day average. A few weeks ago, I shared with you an updated version, and it's kind of hard to see in the room here, but it's out on everyone's websites, um, where the colors haven't changed. The only thing that's changed in the indicators is we're now using a 14-day rolling average as opposed to a seven-day rolling average. I'm going to jump right into it. Um, and I'll try to address one of the concerns we had last week, but the numbers for the state of Connecticut, and this is just for the purposes of showing a trend line, and it's the same chart, but obviously you can see that the latest data set, the chart is going up a little bit larger. But to better put in perspective, because I do want to show the trend in the chart, I'm just going to give you the numbers, show you what they are. So this is the state of Connecticut's numbers. This is exactly where I get it from. And the first thing I'd ask you to all notice is the reporting date in that first column is 11-5. But the actual numbers are for a period of time that for the two 14 days that concluded on October 31st. So what's significant in that? That was 10 days ago. That's what's significant with that. So this is still 10 day old information. But when we talk about the numbers, so the last time we met uh, as a state, we were just getting to 9.9. .9. We were still in that low risk yellow category. And since we've last been in this chambers as a state, we've gone from 9.9 .9 to 19.8. And we've now transitioned into the moderate risk category, which if you were to go back to the original chart here, that would put us in the orange as a state. And that would put us in the orange where the recommendation is to reduce person density, <coughs> excuse me, in school buildings. That's Connecticut, and you can see the positivity rates, the new hospitalizations, but really focus on that leading indicator, that second column. That's the number that we've been told to go by from all the guidance from the State Department of Education and the, and the Department of Public Health. Next, we get into Harford County, and again, that color-coded chart, the original guidelines, and they stuck to it, is that individual school districts should be having these conversations about any adjustments they make to their school plans based upon county, for the reasons I've explained for the last month, I think sitting at this day, so I won't go back into it. But again, you can still see the trend line in the state. It's continuing to rise. But here are the numbers. Same reporting date, October 31st was the last date data was collected in the data drop that came on 11-5. I'll get an update on this, com uh, on this information this Thursday afternoon. It's usually around four or five. Typically, it's after the governor's press conference. They'll upload the information to the state website. If you're interested in looking for it yourself, it's there. Um, and it breaks it down by state, county, and then you can actually dial into individual towns. 
But since we've last met, remember we made that threshold into the moderate risk category at 10.4. As you can see from the numbers, we've gone since the last time we've met in Hartford County from 10.4 to 17.8. So we've remained in that moderate risk category as a county. Um, but now moving on to Enfield. Again, the chart in Enfield, you could see it plateaued a little bit, which is a good sign for us at the moment. That statement comes with a very big asterisk. The data for Enfield, again, same time frame. Um, you could see the last time we met, we were at 5.3, and we've only gone up one point to 6.3 during this data drop. Um, I'm going to stop right here for a moment for two reasons. One is this data isn't public at this point in time, but based on the activity over the last 10 days, I can tell you that our numbers are going to go up. And that comes from our Department of Public Health information that's shared with us, but it's not processed through the Department of Public Health website for it to be calculated in these metrics. Um, but based on recent activity over the last 10 days, we are aware that our numbers are gonna go up and there's a possibility we are gonna change categories relatively quickly. Um, the other reason I wanna pause for here for a moment is when I tell you that our numbers are going to increase over the last 10 day period, um, now's the time for a pop quiz for anyone who wants to raise their hand. What happened 10 days ago? Anyone? Ms. Thurston? Halloween. And although we can't directly attribute a large increase in cases to Halloween, um, we are starting to see a lot more activity. And when we trace back certain activities, we're finding out that they're being directed toward that weekend. Now, there are some that will argue and say, well, wait a minute, kids are outside, most of them are wearing masks, they're going door to door, they're staying six feet apart, it really shouldn't be a large transmission. Yeah, you're right. Does anybody know what was different about this Halloween than Halloween's in recent years past? It was 20 degrees outside and there was snow on the ground. So what we're finding is that a lot of activities that had taken place, traditional Halloween activities and kids being outside in the neighborhood running around, we were finding that a lot of these activities were moved, unfortunately, indoors, albeit maybe with smaller groups. But what we're finding is obviously transmission is larger with smaller groups, um, particularly if you're in a small group of friends and people you know very well, so you're a little less cautious. You may take this off, you may have a sleepover, whatever your family chooses to do. What we're finding is that more activity took place over that weekend because of the weather, to be quite frank. So although the contact tracing isn't gonna come back and say Halloween caused this whole thing, it is a combination, but we are starting to see more cases in district that I can share that we are, when we're, we're doing our contact tracing, we're finding out that a lot of kids were congregating in smaller groups, but together and indoors. And that's been a major concern of ours as we've gotten into the colder months. The next slide, um, before I put it, I'm not doing this to scare anybody, and I just wanna set the stage as to why I picked this date. I wanted to give everyone a snapshot of what it actually looks like on a daily basis. And I know there's a lot of discussion about what type of program we should be in. I know there's some who feel very strongly that our kids should be back in five days a week. I wish I can do it. There's others that say the kids shouldn't be there at all. I understand that point of view as well. What we're trying to do is continue to do what the best possible opportunities we can for our kids. And in our opinion, getting them in school for as much as we can is still in the best interest of, our, of all of our kids. But trying to do it safely and still maintaining um, the safety and the protections for our staff is still our highest priority. That said, I took the most recent snapshot, which was yesterday. I couldn't do today because the day wasn't over when I finished this. But I took yesterday just to paint a picture for you and those who, who may be watching at home. What do we do all day long? This is it. Yesterday, we had 83 staff members absent for COVID-related issues and 262 students that were absent for COVID-related issues. Now, let me be very clear. That does not mean that we had 83 positive COVID cases with staff members in Enfield yesterday. That was not the case. But of those 83 staff members, I said they are COVID-related, and COVID-related could be they could be positive themselves. Um, they could be a direct contact and are forced to quarantine. They could live with a close contact where someone in their home. So if you're talking about a staff member, if they get a call that their child is a direct contact and has to quarantine for 14 days, as I explained two weeks ago, we had a similar case where we had a staff member who 
their child was a close contact that we made the decision to keep them out until the child's test came back. So we're talking what we thought would be an extra two days, ultimately only to find out that the child tested positive and ultimately the staff member tested positive. So because of that, we were out yesterday alone, 83 staff members. Now that's not all teachers. I don't, I don't be very clear about that. Someone had said to me recently, well, it's not all teachers, so that's okay. What people have to realize is that if your teachers are missing, every staff member in that building is being asked to cover. Because if you break it down in its simplest form, if we have students in our classrooms and on our buildings, we need adult supervision at all costs. And as I've said before from this microphone, the cavalry isn't coming to help us. There are no substitutes. There aren't people, retirees, that want to come back and work. We're on our own till we get through this. And it's very difficult to get, to get through this when we have 83 staff members absent for no fault of their own. And a lot of these cases, because we're telling them they have to be, are absent because of some sort of COVID-related illness. And the same goes for students. Yesterday, we had 262 students, again, that were either in quarantine. Now, all these kids weren't in quarantine. There are some students on here that their families did the right thing, and they called in the morning and said, my son or daughter is showing symptoms. So we asked them to stay home. Those are included in the numbers. Because quite honest, we don't know whether or not they've been exposed if they're positive or not. But if somebody has COVID-like symptoms, like I've said back from the summer, please don't come into school, <laughs> please don't come to work. So it's the combination of, of all of these factors that are leading to a staffing crisis for us and for every other district in the state of Connecticut right now. I was on with the Hartford area superintendents today and I thought I was gonna be the one complaining about how many staff members were out. And I was outdone by some of my colleagues who have it worse than me right now. Um, you're gonna hear a lot in the coming days and probably week about how districts are gonna to react to the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday. And I said this last meeting and I just wanna repeat it again. I have not made a decision yet, but at the end of this week, I have to do something that I never thought I'd have to do. And I'm gonna stare at my teacher friends in the audience right now. I have to ask you what your holiday plans are. And normally you have the right to tell me it's none of my damn business. <laughs> and I would respect that. Why I have to ask them that is because if people are still planning on traveling for Thanksgiving, which is their right? As much as we like to tell people and you hear, you know, elected officials all the time say, do virtual Thanksgiving, do all that. You can't force people to do that. The airports are open. They're not stopping you. So if people are choosing to visit their family who they may have not seen in the last seven to eight months, I don't have any legal authority to stop them from doing that. But what that means practically for us is Thanksgiving's on a Thursday. And if people are going to go out of town for more than 24 hours, and now it's not particular states. It's not, well, you just can't go to Florida. You just can't go to Arizona. Maine got put on the list today. New Hampshire is on the list right now. It's every other 49 state and territory in this country. If you're going out of state for more than 24 hours, you are mandated to quarantine for 14 days, or you can get a test and you can garner the negative results of that test. But the funny thing is you don't have to give it to me. Technically, if you're coming out of state, you have to give that to the Department of Public Health so that you don't get fined. And I'm sorry I'm picking on you, Michelle. You're the only, okay. I thought Emily was yeah. gonna be here and I can't, I can't say this to her. She ducked out of it. Realistically, what does that mean for us? That means, we'll say since Emily's not here, Emily travels out of town, out of state for Thanksgiving and she flies back Saturday. She can be meet at a Bradley airport and get a test right then and there. But what we've learned is normally at, in the testing, particularly at Bradley, it's 48 to 72 hours to expect the results, which means if she comes off of that plane on Saturday or Sunday, she's not going to have those results. And by state law, or else she'd be fined, she has to quarantine until, those resort, until the negative result is, is garnished, which means she can't come to work on Monday, <laughs> which means any person who's possibly thinking of traveling over the holiday. And unfortunately, that even means if you have family right over the border and you're staying for more than 24 hours, same rules apply. Every state is on the list right now for, for beyond 24 hours. The reality is if enough people are gonna be traveling and these numbers increase, 
we don't have enough adults to open our buildings in the immediate days after the Thanksgiving Day break. Now, I don't have that information today. I haven't sent that survey out yet today. I didn't want to ruin people's Veterans Day tomorrow with, I got to tell this guy where I'm going for Thanksgiving. It's none of his business. So that will go out at the end of the week. But that's going to have a, a, a very big impact on the decision that I need to make as far as what school is going to look like, particularly the week after Thanksgiving. I just don't know at this point. I can tell you with all the numbers that I've showed you earlier with transmission and um, color codes and risk rates, all that stuff is, is very alarming. And I'm, we all have seen it. We've all hear about it every day on, on the radio, driving in or on the TV if you turn it on at night. Um, but I, the thing that's going to force my hand to make a decision as to how what kind of program we're running in our schools is going to be this. Do we have the staff to keep our buildings open? I put them up individually by school, not to brag about some school doing better than another. Because if I showed this to you last week, Eagle Academy wouldn't be at zero. Um, I put it up here because at any given moment, one or more of these schools are on the brink. And as I sit here every week and praise our teachers deservedly for the monumental task that they do every single day in trying to get our kids through this, often we overlook our administrators in this process. And that's my fault, um, but and I, and I will take ownership for that, but I can't overlook them any longer. Our administrators, particularly our principals and assistant principals, this is in addition to running their buildings and dealing with whatever fire happens to be going on during that day, the majority of their time over the last three weeks is trying to schedule their building to stay open. And that's not just Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's three o'clock in the morning on Sunday, I guess it would be. That would be 5.30 in the morning on Saturday morning. That's a conversation that I, the, the three conversations I had Friday evening ended finally at 11 o'clock when I had to tell a principal, you're not calling anyone now anyway, so why don't you go to sleep? Those are the conversations that our administrators are having where it's come to, if you want us to stay open, this is what we're gonna need to do. In some cases, we've had to go against what we originally said and ask staff to cover other buildings because the alternative was they just weren't going to be open. And you can do the math and figure out which ones would have closed first. Um, now, our hope is as these total numbers go down, if there's overlapping quarantine periods or time people need to be exposed or waiting upon test results, that means people are able to return. And our hope all along has been that these numbers start to plateau and people can start returning. But the reality is it's gotten much worse since the last time I've been in this room with you guys. And I'm, again, I'm not trying to, to be a downer and, and deliver bad news, but I think I have, I have an obligation, not just to the eight of you, but more importantly to everybody who's out there watching to tell them the truth. And the truth is we're hanging on. And I'll answer one more question, but before I get off this slide, our priority is to stay open. Whatever you think of the program we're in now, our opinion is that's open. Our kids are coming into schools. Our priority is to stay open. That's it. That's the message, that's the statement. And we're doing everything in our power to do that. Our principals are turning water into wine to cover buildings on a daily basis. So much so that, and, that, and I, the reason I put its total staff on there is because it's not just teachers. We've got paraprofessionals, cafeteria workers. We've got clerical staff members. We've got principals and assistant principals and department coordinators covering classes. Because if they don't, we got to close. And I think that's more detrimental to, for a kid to get a call that their building's closed for a week or for 14 days than, you know what, I may not have my teacher for a couple of days. Now, that doesn't mean we still don't have some section of classes that are out, as you all know, and I've, I've informed the board, that had to go distance learning. But so far, we haven't had to close full buildings. It's been cohorts or individual classrooms. We're doing the best we can to keep them open. I just can't make that promise beyond the day. So I just wanted to be upfront with everybody so they knew exactly where we're coming from in the event I ever have to make that phone call. I hope I never have to make to say that we're close. Lastly, and let's try to answer the question. This is this even confused me a little bit because Mr. Barassa is way too good at putting charts together. So I'll do my best to explain what this means. But I apologize, Mr. Salazar, you asked this question two weeks in a row. 
And although the raw numbers aren't on here, I will get those for you, but I wanted to put in a visual for the public to see. So if you look at these charts, and you can't read underneath, it's a little small, but that's per building. So it starts with Eagle Academy, then Enfield Street School, Eli Whitney. Um, I can't even read that. Enfield High School obviously is the larger one. JFK is the other larger one. What the colors mean are those are cohorts. That's cohort A is blue. Cohort B is green. The yellow is what we call cohort C, or those are our students who are permitted to come Monday or four days a week. M mostly those are our students with special needs. And then red is our remote learners. So you can see by building what the percentages are um, for kids that are coming either in their cohort, which the blue and the green would be in person. And then obviously the red number would be those who cho chosen to go remotely. What I can share is from the beginning of the year till today, when we first started, we were at about 25% of our population had chosen the remote option, we're now at a third. So we've gone from 25 to a little over 33% of parents who have opted to bring to, to keep their kids on a more remote or distance learning plan. Um, and again, that does those numbers do not include students who are on the previous slide that are home for whatever particular reason. That's just how they're currently registered. And I didn't want to create a 45 minute presentation just on that. So if anyone wants more raw data, we can talk after the meeting and I will send it to the entire board. Um, so that's the end. I want to go back to this for a second. We're doing everything we can to stay open. And that Mr. Chairman concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. S superintendent. Uh, we're going to ask questions during our board member comments, so we will move on to, so I can see something, to uh, audiences, number eight. Um, anyone in, in the audience wish to speak? You have three minutes, and we're going to take the roll. The assistant superintendent is going to take your name and address, and after that, I'll start the three-minute timer. So just whoever wants to come on up first, we'll start with the one way in the back. She had her hand up first. So say your name and address clearly, and then we, uh, I'll start the three-minute timer. I'm fogging, so bear with me. Thank you. Trish Neal Berry, 48 Buchanan Road. Um, I'm aware that you're voting on policies today, and part of that vote is considering taking out several CABE-recommended policies. CABE made these suggestions for a reason, because state mandates may not be enough to fully support our children, and these policies give the town and the board a leg to stand on and a position to back up and support those mandates. In watching the policy subcommittee meeting, um, the chair's made it clear that in particular he does not want the Board of Ed to take a strong stance on protections for transgender and non-conforming students. The chair and the other person who voted to get rid of these policies have made it clear that they do not support every child every day. These are some of your most at-risk youth, many of whom don't have full parental support in being their true selves. By even considering and verbalizing that you do not think that they are worth your protection, you're sending a clear message that they do not matter to you. These additional policies are created and suggested by CABE because clearly CABE thought that the sta state mandates were not enough. CABE's full-time job is to assist local boards of education in providing the best education for all kids. All kids. In addition, it appears so that you don't seem anti-LBGTQ, you're also throwing several other groups of at-risk kids under the bus by getting rid of those policies. Uh, the kids that will lose additional protections include those who have been cyberbullied, sexually assaulted, kids uh, with concussions, and kids with specific dietary needs. Shame on you for even considering taking out these policies and protections. When you vote, I urge you to remember, every child, every day, if you're not protecting them all, why are you even on the board? And finally, I want to say thank you to Chris and Andy. You've been doing a great job, and Hybrid's been working so far. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Name and address for the record. Gina Sullivan, 11 Spear Avenue. I want to tell you, um, you do a great job. 
I don't even have a child in this district at this time, but I watch the meetings just to hear your updates because of the detail you go into. My son is actually uh, distance learning entirely, so I don't really have to worry about the updates at his school. But I learned about contact tracing and how it works, I think, from your last call or your last meeting. So I appreciate everything that you share. And don't let the pressure get to you. Um, I know some may feel that it's not warranted. But today, it's Tuesday, November 10th, and the virus is still here. In any event, um, I'm here tonight to find out there's currently a vacancy on the Board of Ed. So when you go to the town site and you open the application for vacancies, there's a drop down that you can choose to pick which, um, you know, where you want to fill it. And I notice Board of Ed isn't there. Just curious why. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Go ahead, sir. Mask off. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening. Joshua Hamry, 52 New King Street. It's been a while since I've been here, and I'm going to make the most of my three-minute time, which, by the way, is atrociously infringing upon the public's rights to speak to this board to limit my time to three minutes because you don't want to hear what we have to say. I know I've not been here in a while, but trust me when I say it's not because I'm not caring. To these concerns that uh, until recently I was not tracking because I trust my elected officials to do what's right for the town, everybody in it. So I take for granted that that's what's happening. But then I catch wind of this. Why didn't it take policies that protect students and the most vulnerable of the students to take those protections away from them. For what reason? What harm comes from protecting kids that need them? I don't know how you can live with that premise that you are in a position where you can say, well, this person that's going through a transitional period in their time doesn't need to have a school board that understands or teachers or educators or administrators that understand what it means to have cyberbullying take place to give them the training that goes along with protecting the children that are going through a transition that they themselves do not understand so to have this conversation come up in front of these signs where you want to say that you make a difference in enfield for every child every day that is just beyond the pale in terms of hypocrisy. I don't understand why this is even an issue. Why? Why do we have to have a conversation to this in 19, excuse me, 2020? We're almost in 2021. Why do we have to have a conversation about the whether or not it's okay for someone to be transgender, for someone to be gay, for someone to be queer, to someone to be any one of these, these categories that you yourself do not know what it means to be, assuming you don't. If you do, I wish that you would take the defense of those that are sitting at home right now wondering how they're going to tell their parents what's going to happen when they come out to their school, what's going to happen when they come out to their church. How are they going to feel protected if the school, if the Board of Education decides that they don't deserve to have educators and administrators that are trained to protect them from the bullies that are going to be there no matter what? There's clearly other categories of students that you're going to be voting on to take protections away from. And uh, if this is the actual list of them, homeless students, I, I don't even want to go into that. I appreciate my three minutes, but if you would consider this to be something that is even a topic of discussion, you're in a position you're not, allowed, you're not qualified to be in. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Please. Marcy Telesio, 23 Coolidge. Um, this may come as a shock, but you're doing amazing. You're doing great, both of you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, regardless of whatever pressures uh, you may be facing, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. I have my own opinions on that. You're putting our kids first. And I really, really think you guys are doing a great job. I also want to thank our amazing teachers and paras who have bent over backwards to make sure our kids continue to stay engaged. I can't even, I'm home with mine and I, I want to jump out the window half the time, but teachers and paras, I don't know how you're doing it, especially right now, so thank you. I started to go through all of the policies to highlight the important information about each one of them. Um, but then it just really boiled down to taking away the rights of students, not providing important information to parents, teachers that need to reflect back on the policies when needed. I understand that your position is that these are laws already so why do we need to put in our policy? How do you expect parents to know that these are laws, where to go? Are they supposed to get attorneys now? So you're, you're putting even more burden on our parents and teachers to find out how their child is covered under the law or the federal mandates. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. I heard Walter say in a policy meeting that the reason why some of these are need to be removed, uh, and I think it was specifically around the transgender policy, was because of the fear that it opens us up for lawsuits. That's not a good enough reason. By a two to one vote, the policy committee has decided that it's, the, it's best to remove policies that protect students with uh, disabilities, um, you know, transgender, gender non-conforming, students with IEPs and 504s, um, special dietary needs. Why shouldn't we put that in our policies for our families to view? Isn't that why we have them? Are we not being transparent with our parents and teachers? That's what they reflect back on when they're looking to have a discussion. So removing these policies only strengthens the community's opinion that there is a lack of transparency in Enfield government. And Josh is absolutely right. You should not be here if you're not here for the good of all students. And who chose seating? That looks a little pompous. Anyone else? Anyone else? Nope. Go ahead. So we can step aside for you to come first, believe me. Elizabeth Davis, I reside at 201 North Maple Street. So I like to always start with a positive and try to end with one. I'm thinking here, hold on. First off, I wanna thank Mr. Ryder because of the policy meeting it wasn't virtual, but it said it was, and I tried to find it so I can watch it, um, and it wasn't, so I called my elected official, and thank you for going over what happened at the meeting. I do appreciate it. I wish that was said to the public ahead of time. To me, that was kind of untransparent when we have problems with the policy, a lot of policies, because we're targeting transgender students. 20 policies, three minutes, I guess I can't go down on them all. What I am requesting for the Board of Ed is when you go down to your you know, 11 new business B and you're going over these policies that you wanna first read, that you read every policy. I had to cop, print policies off from the packet from the September meeting. Where are these policies located? If anybody can answer me. This is the packet I came and spoke a month ago. Remember when I could hardly speak after my surgery? 
They disappeared. Where are they for the parents? When I went on it, if you aren't there, so we just, not your new ones that you don't even want, the ones that were there. So. I really, yeah, Marcy's, you're right with the seating. I also want to thank Miss Blank when I called you about sports stuff and all this. You answer everything. If you don't have the answer, you get the answer. You're always on our Enfield High page. I don't know how you find the time because you have probably 100 questions and you are respectful to every parent, even if they're upset. I personally want to thank you for that and let you know we truly appreciate all that you're doing. Now the vote for tonight, also I'm requesting, because frankly this vote is gonna show the public tonight once and for all, who stands for every child every day in Enfield Public Schools and who doesn't. You took a year since election. This is your biggest accomplishment, trying to get rid of policies. I know they're a law. You look at the transgender one, you know what's great? Anybody watching at home, why we really need these policies? Quick to find, and then on it, tells you your different laws you can go to. If you don't notice the shirt, we all know it. So I like to advertise to the town of Enfield. Let's get one thing straight, I'm not. Did you ask anybody in the GLBTQ community, anybody that has a child in the system that is, did you talk to any of the diverse club people before you even brought this up? I guess you ain't too happy that it was behind closed doors. And I am requesting, don't table it again because you have us watching. You guys like to table things and do it behind closed doors. Closing with my positive, you two deserve the best medal out to the highest medal. You're keeping our kids alive, our teachers and our staff, and I can never thank you much. And you all talk about Veterans Day, we flop for everybody, they don't pick and choose who. So start representing everybody and lead right. Thank you. That's my compliment to you. Anyone else wish to speak? Anyone else? I declare public communications closed. So we will start with uh, board member comments. Uh, Mr. Salazar, please. Pass. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc, any comments? All right, first to uh, go back to uh, Mr. Jurezic's report, just a, just a couple questions for you on that. Um, speaking of these uh, superintendent meetings and discussing what other districts are doing, in relation to that, first, is, is there any way to get or watch or view or get notes from these meetings? And then my second question in, in reference to that is just kind of curious on how other, because I know it's not, we just went over our staff shortage issue. Um, I know that's been a problem across the state of Connecticut. So I was just kind of curious as how other districts were handling the same situation, same problem. Uh, the first answer would be no. <laughs> Those are um, Hartford area superintendents meetings where there's, I don't believe there's a, uh, a secretary. I don't believe they're public meetings because they're not in the capacity of like your work is. Um, and a lot of it also derives from having private conversations with colleagues as well. Um, so no, there, there isn't a way to view those meetings that are open to the public. Um, that also gives us an opportunity to have candid conversations about your second question about exactly how other districts are doing it. Um, and a lot of other dis a lot of districts are doing things very similar to the way we are. Um, there are some districts who um, were fortunate, and I've heard this a couple of times, well, what if we just designated um, uh, virtual teachers where they would just have a class of themselves and that way the teacher would teach virtually for just those kids and the other teachers would have I can almost hear they're grumbling from Emily because we've had this conversation over time. What sometimes gets lost in that is those teachers are actually being funded because those are alliance districts. 
So there's money specifically set aside that was set aside prior to the COVID relief funding that came across, didn't come across our desk until after we were knee deep into this. So that's money that's built into their budgets for them to do that. So there are a handful of districts that have, have remote teachers only. Um, you know, I think ideally, if we knew this was going to continue, that's something we would try to create the funding for. But as you know, we're, we're dealing on a shoestring anyway. Um, so that would be impossible for us to do. Um, and to be honest, a lot of people are trying to buy their way out of this, too, with trying to find coverage and they're not being successful. I know one superintendent who will remain nameless um, put, shamelessly put himself out there saying, I'm going to jack up the rates to try to come to my town as opposed to going somewhere else. Uh, and he reported back that it didn't really work. So, uh, and again, I'm not, that's not, not to be negative to the superintendent. He was more creative than I was, where he beat us all to it and put, you know, got in front of as many cameras as he could and said, we're jacking our rates up for subs and there wasn't as many takers. So right now, um, the, the vast majority of us in the area, and I can only speak to the ones that I know, um, are piecemealing it together just like we are. Because as I said, the pool of people um, is just not there. Our, our Kelly subs who are doing everything they can to get us people. I didn't get this week's numbers, but as I told you in the past, we average about, we went from 60 to 70 a week to three. Um, and you know, I know that the state had made a big push to make it easier um, for retirees to come back and cover. Um, but the one thing that they kind of miscalculated was in order to be a retiree, you have to have a certain amount of years in, which by default puts you in a certain age bracket, which by default, People in that particular age bracket aren't necessarily interested in coming back into a school right now. I'm just being honest. So it, it, that's been a challenge, and, and it was kind of universal that you know the it, the transmission rate isn't what's going to be that what does us in. It's going to be we don't have enough we don't have enough adults in the building. Not sure if that answered everything, but no, it does. Um, in relation to uh, the substitutions, uh, three three is a scary number. Um, and I know it was also brought up previously that the state uh, allowed for those. It was a requirement that you had a bachelor's and now they moved it to an associates. Has that changed yeah, uh, applicants or, or people looking into that specific field at all with them allowing that? Or? Um, no, actually, they, they even made a further adjustment where you can have, I'm oh, sorry, I keep getting confused. You don't necessarily even need an associate's degree. You can do a high school diploma. It hasn't increased the applicant pool. Um, now, traditionally, the applicant pool would become more increased in about two weeks from now. However, the prospect of a million college kids coming home wanting to be substitute teachers when we don't really want them coming, <laughs> bringing whatever they may have gotten in college home with them is yet another challenge of, because we have, you know, seen an increase um, over the years through winter break, particularly for college kids coming home who may have had enough credits where they can do some substitute teaching for us. Uh, and particularly in May, we get a, a large increase of college students who come home and, and, and come and work as substitutes. This year is going to be a little bit more challenging because some of them are in quarantine in their colleges right now or can't come home for, can't work for us for 14 days because they got a quarantine because they're coming from out of state. So again, it's, it's a, you know, I'm trying to find the right way to say it. It's not just one contributing factor. It's like every little thing that's stacking up against us is at the same time. And again, we're hopeful that, you know, we, we turn a corner and we can start getting back to normal at some point. But. And then I guess my last question would be in relation to the um, staff that are out due to COVID related issues. How many of those are included staff members who tested negative but still cannot return because of state guidelines? I, I don't have the exact number of that, but there are there are a few, quite a few who are, if you're, just so everyone's clear, if you are mandated to quarantine for 14 days because you're a direct contact, you can get a test. You can garnish the negative test to me five days later and say that you're clear, it doesn't matter. You're in quarantine for 14 days. And the rationale for that is that you could still be car either carrying the virus or transmitting the virus during that 14 day, uh, during that 14 day period. So we have had staff members who have been close contacts, have gotten tested, had had their whole families tested, but they unfortunately still have to remain in quarantine for that 14 day period. Can you repeat that last part again? The 
So you can carry the virus even if you test negative? Yes. Okay. During that 14-day okay. incubation period. Yeah. That's new to me. Okay. Um, yeah, so those, those are my questions um, in regard to your report. Um, I am highly encouraged that you are keeping it a priority to stay open. And I say that with the basis that back in August, when we were making the initial decision of what to do with our school system, it was a debate on whether we go full in person or as we are hybrid. That was, those were basically the two given options that we were gonna put our district under with the option to, if you were not comfortable, go fully remote. Now fast forward to November 10th, and I feel like that debate has shifted from full in person to now we're fighting to even keep the hybrid model going. So now it's becoming, I, I see it already. I see Shelton, it just came out before a meeting, uh, I believe region four, and there was um, another district, Winstead, I think. Yeah, I know there was three, Hamden. three or four Hamden that were gonna make their decision to go from hybrid to fully remote. And as it was stated at a previous meeting, I think patience is the, is the key here, especially for members of our community. No, again, I will say on record, nobody wants the kids full in person more than me. I think it's the best solution, but given the circumstances we're living under right now, I think we need to be patient and continue with the hybrid model to keep this train going because as it was said in the previous meeting, which I 110% agree with, if we can't see our kids five days a week, at least we're seeing them too. But now it's, now it's going in the direction and it's closing in where we are now fighting for two days. And uh, so we'll see where it goes, but I, I see it, this, it's, there are other districts that have already enacted it and I'm, I'm pretty disappointed. I, I, I will be myself very disappointed if we were to go fully remote. I think it would be a mistake. Um, obviously there's factors that we might not have control over that force that issue. And if that's the case, nothing can be done about it. But um, until that situation arises, Thank you for keeping it a priority to stay open for a week and at least see our kids for two days a week. Um, just to, the public communications, and if it, if it comes up in discussion, um, I will clarify where I stand later um, in regards to our 5,000 series. But just for the public's aware, as far as I'm aware myself, we are not taking out any policies that were already in place. Everything that was there or is required from CABE is moving forward. Nothing is being pulled back and taken out. And so. But they were there. Recommendations we're talking about. Recommendations. There was no policies that were, that were already in our Enfield Public School policy book that are being retracted. As far as I'm aware, that's that's how it's done. Again, I'll save some of my thoughts for later on in regards to that. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, Mr. Jurezic, do we have do we have uh, any numbers on the youth vote? I know kids. It was mentioned at the kite meeting that uh, many of the kids were disappointed they couldn't participate in the youth vote, but the school still held some kind of a vote and you were to get the numbers? There was a youth vote number. I haven't gotten them yet. Though. Okay, all right. All right, last but not least, um, it's, it's uh, <laughs> Trish, you're, you're gonna be all over me, but <laughs> winter sports and, and extracurricular activities, it's, it's new that last week, all high risk category sports will not be played for the rest of the year. Again, I feel like this is deja vu because 
they have the state of Connecticut, the Department of Public Health put out three categories, high risk, moderate risk, and lower risk, and rank those sports. And the definitions in each of those categories stayed pretty much exactly the same as what they had in the fall. High risk, close sustained contact between participants, lack of significant protective barriers, and a high likelihood of respiratory particles that will be transmitted. Moderate risk, close sustained contact, but with protective equipment in place that may reduce the likelihood of res respiratory particle transmission. And then of course, lower risk is done with social distancing or it's an individual sport. One, a lot of these sports have been played all along, starting back in the, in the summer, back when we knew even less about COVID and they were heavily successful in doing so. I had Enfield Rambler kids who were over and playing in Ellington football. They just completed their season Sunday. No problems. At least those kids got an opportunity to do something outside, right? Because back in March when, when COVID unfortunately hit the United States, at least we had the idea that, okay, let's get around this bend. Summer's coming. The weather's nice. We can be outside. Now we're on the back end of that. Now we're in November. It's cold, it's gonna get cold, and it's gonna get dark. And you wanna talk about mental illness? The mental illness, if you thought it was bad in March when you had summer coming and, and, and nice days outside to go look forward to, now you don't have that anymore and it's dark at four o'clock. And then you're gonna take these extracurriculars away from our kids who need something to look forward to. It's, so the whole idea of mental illness when, when people talk about, it, yeah, now I'm even more concerned about it to be quite frank. So I look at this and, and I look at one sport in particular. Well, actually, there's three that caught my eye in the high risk category because they're mostly done in the winter. Wrestling, cheer and dance. I drive by Riley's pretty frequent. They seem to be doing pretty well. No problems there. But now they're done. Wrestling. I can, I, the definition, I can see close sustained contact between participants, but then let's go to the moderate risk category. What sports being played in the moderate risk category? Oh, you have basketball there. Now I'm a sports guy. I know how these sports are played. I wrestled in high school. Basketball includes sweat, rubbing up against each other and close contact. Now they have to wear masks. That's, that's one of the new requirements, even while playing. So if that's the case, <laughs> Why can't our wrestlers wear a mask and be all set too? Because <laughs> they do the same exact things basketball players do in their activity. So again, all the to me, it just it lacks scientific backing or any guidance or, or direction on where these de decisions are being made from. It to me, it doesn't make sense. You go back to Governor Lamont's press briefing last week. He had two categories on sports. Not one of those slides had any information about where he was making his decisions. It was just his decisions laid out. Nothing to back it up. Same thing with the Department of Public Health. These definitions, they don't really sum up anything to me. It doesn't tell me where you're getting your decisions from. As I just gave the, the difference between basketball and wrestling, I'd love for a, a, an official from the Department of Public Health come and scientifically tell me and then, and then maybe I, you know I'll stop spieling about this stuff. But this opinion time, or are we talking about facts? In the we're talking about facts. We're talking. We're talking about facts, right? Because I'm trying to find the facts where these decisions are being made, and I'm having a real hard time doing that. Two slides by our governor isn't facts. It's him making a decision, but based on what? Maybe the decision's the right decision, but show me where you're getting this information from. Same thing. Same. Same thing with. Same thing with uh, extracurriculars, such as band or theater. I know of another school district that Christmas is right around the corner. All the Christmas concerts should be going on in 2020. <laughs> Mr. Superintendent, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're still not moving forward with anything. But this other school district is at least allowing their students to perform on a virtual basis. So the students are allowed to perform in theater. There'll be no audience to parents and family members can watch from home. We need to start thinking outside the box to allow this stuff to happen instead of just saying, we gotta end this, we gotta end this, there's no alternative. Start thinking outside the box to give these kids an opportunity to do so. 
because it's only it's only going to get worse. You're taking away things from kids that mean the most to them, especially in these hard times, without any alternative. So, how how do we approach that? Is it something we can do where we can come up with a waiver to say sign the waiver? You take your you can sign the waiver and the school district, anything COVID related happened is not liable anymore. Is that an option? I don't know, but I'm trying to think outside the box a little bit with these situations. I know when I, I signed up for my gym, once they opened back up from COVID, I had to sign a, COVID, a, a new policy in place, a COVID waiver. So the gym's not held liable anymore in case something happens. Is that something we can expand to a school district level? It's something to look into. Maybe not, but I'd, I'd like to know, I'd like to be told no, rather than just saying nothing can be done about this. So anyways, I just, it just boils down to we need to start thinking outside the box and figuring out what we can do for our children because they're the most vulnerable in this situation. So I'd like, I'd, I'd like to see people not show two slides and without any backing and rather come out and say, okay, maybe we can't do this, but this here is why. And maybe I'll be a little more understanding. But that's all for tonight. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Mr. Unger. Uh, just, just two things. Uh, one, um, Superintendent uh, Dresick, the, um, the state's rolling average went from seven days to 14. Correct. And what, 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 did they provide any rationale? What's the rationale for that change? Uh, the rationale given, oh, sorry, keep forgetting. Uh, the rationale given at the time of the switch was that uh, it painted a more accurate picture, judging that information on a 14-day rolling average than it did on a seven-day rolling average. But that was a decision made by the Department of Health, Public Health. I, we weren't consulted on it. I, I don't. I don't know that. That was what we were told. Okay. I just didn't understand the uh, the rationale and wanted to know what that was. And uh, secondly, lastly, I just wanted to um, offer up my condolences to the family and friends of Lisa Dupuy and um, it's just it's just very sad when especially sad and painful when someone young passes and especially someone who cared about our our students and I'm certain that you know they love they they loved her and and uh, she was uh, just a just such a, a contributor I I didn't <coughs> the thing is, I didn't know Lisa Dupuy I didn't know her personally, but I could understand the loss of a f family member. And I know how painful that is. And I just want to offer up condolences to her family and to her friends and, and especially to, uh, you know, her students who, who knew and loved her. Very sorry. Thank you, Mr. Ongeyer. Do we want to start at the end, Mr. Ryder? Sure, thank you. <clears throat> I, I did know Mrs. Dupuy. Um, I went to her family services this afternoon and um, I brought something on behalf of the Board of Education and the superintendent's office. Um, and what I wanted to relay to her family was my thanks uh, to them, because as we know, teaching is a full-time job. And she gave a lot of herself to us, to our town and to our schools. And might have left a little bit less for her two girls at one point or another. Um, so something that, that I wrote to Lisa and her family was, uh, to Lisa Dupuy's family, our school system, our teachers, and almost a thousand of our tiny humans, including my son, have benefited tremendously from having you share your heart, your art, and your soul with us. Thank you to Mrs. Dupuy for the impact you made on my son, but thank you to Lisa for helping me personally with many of our PTO fundraisers over the six years we worked together, always willing to donate a beautiful painting of yours or some art supplies to a PTO raffle basket, and thank you for sharing your personal time with us as an event volunteer. I hope your family knows how special you are to us. I hope that they find some comfort in knowing that or from hearing that once again from another one of the countless families that you've touched. 
the Ryder family personally thanks you, including Elliot. And yes, he has finally remembered to start to close the door when he uses the toilet. <laughs> Most of the time. Mrs. Dupuy shared her favorites with me during Teacher Appreciation Week. As the PTO dad in that school, I used to talk to all the teachers and staff, from our custodial services to our admins, everybody in the building, we, we celebrated. And I'd have them fill out a little questionnaire with your favorites, we call them. And this is what Mrs. Dupuy wrote to me. She says, tell them I love the color purple and peach. I love horses, dogs, and cats. And her favorite flowers are sunflowers. And this gave the kids and their families some ideas if they wanted to make a drawing or a poem for the teachers for Teacher Appreciation Week. So I want to ask all my HMS Huskies now or over the past 35, 36 years who might have had Mrs. Dupuy at some point to wear your PJs proudly for EPS PJ Day for CCMC this December to honor Miss Dupuy and her valiant fight with cancer and an email that she wrote to me that I pulled out from a couple years back said, Mr. Ryder, and I can hear her voice and her, I can hear her laugh. <laughs> Room 100 kindergarten writers have been very busy this week. They're tasked with per writing persuasive letters. They chose to write them directly to you for raising money towards our new playground. These writers would love the opportunity to read their letters. And if you're available one day next week, could you come into Room 100 so they can read them to you personally? Thank you for all you do, Lisa Dupuy and the kindergarten crew. And Mrs. Hunter sent out a, a very nice letter earlier uh, this week, um, last week, I should say. Um, and she wanted me, or she wanted to remind all the HMS families that Mrs. Dupuy's favorite saying was teamwork, teamwork makes the dream work. So I just want to remind everybody of that, try to work together better. And again, if you have a young student if they have any questions about this or, or how to talk about this, you know, please reach out to Mrs. Hunter or any of your teachers and, and uh, they'll be willing to uh, lend an ear. Um, but thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Mrs. Dupuy <laughs> um, for everything. Um, that is my update for Hazardville. Um, uh, Eli Whitney's doing something that I think Lisa would have loved. Um, they are raising money through acts of, kind, acts of kindness. So the Eli Whitney School is currently running a kindness focused fundraising campaign called Raise Craze. With this unique school year, the PTO is looking for a fundraiser that didn't involve selling products, was contactless, and of course, where all students, whether hybrid or remote, could participate. If the building is closed, or if you're hybrid, you are still going to school. So the premise behind the fundraisers was students would ask family and friends to make a donation to their school, and in return, they'd pay forward their donor's generosity by performing an act of kindness. Students have done everything from bringing in a neighbor's trash barrel, uh, decorating a mailbox for their mail carrier, or to help a grandparent with yard work. With Raise Craze, no act of kindness is too small. So just at Eli Whitney, we've been doing this, and we chose a specific act this week where every student is writing a letter or making a card that will be delivered to a deployed service member during our holiday season. In a true pay it forward fashion, we found out that one of our Eli Whitney students has a parent currently on active deployment and will be through the holidays. So working with Lori Gates and Enfield Hua, the school has made arrangements to have letters and cards sent school-wide to this specific parent and their service unit. Service unit, I apologize. <clears throat> so thank you, Whitney Wolves. Thank you, HMS Huskies. Uh, quickly from JFK, uh, if you're a grade seven parent, you'll be getting an email uh, one night this week, uh, Thursday specifically for grade seven at 6 p.m. Make sure that you follow the link on that email to sign up for your parent-teacher conferences. To backtrack, I had a parent-teacher conference this afternoon um, so after I visited with the Dupuy family and I saw so many HMS teachers and Stowe teachers, because we used to have the pre-K used to be at Hazardville. So the Stowe teachers came over as well. Um, and I left there and I went home and I did my parent-teacher conference virtually with Ms. Lesky at uh, Eli Whitney and fabulous things to say. Good, good, good for us. We're doing a good job at home. <laughs> and she is as well. God bless her. Um, <laughs> Also at JFK, uh, camo day for Veterans Day, uh, because Veterans Day is tomorrow. 
we're not, we do, we do distance learning normally on Wednesdays, but tomorrow we're off completely. Um, so they did a camo day for the uh, cohort A on Tuesday and cohort B will be Friday, wear your camo. Uh, there's a link up on enfieldpto.com slash JFK so you can order your yearbook already. Um, let's hope they come in on time. <laughs> you can sign up for the virtual turkey trot at JFK. Again, happy Veterans Day to all. Also, I have cousins in the U.S. Marine Corps, um, which was founded 245 years ago today, November 10th, 1775. So happy 245th. Um, and also as a reminder, wreaths across America, all schools K through grade eight have a link where you can buy a wreath for wreaths across America through the school's PTO. And it'll be placed here in the cemetery here, here in Enfield. Uh, and to the PTOs that I was working with to order additional masks, the green Enfield Eagle at masks were ordered. Uh, so everybody that sent me your orders, um, we've already been in communication, but just so everybody knows, the parents who may have ordered it, uh, they, they've been ordered and we hope to have them by the end of next week or at least before the Thanksgiving break to pass out. Um, thank you to everybody that spoke tonight. Thank you, Michelle and Emily for coming as well. Um, and just to clarify one thing, uh, so these policies, which we'll discuss in a little bit, but I just want to clear up one thing. On August 10th, the policy subcommittee passed the 5000 series, which included the 18 policies that are now not being discussed tonight. So they were pub publicly posted. We received them by email on August, uh, sorry, August 10th. They were passed through the subcommittee it was a former incarnation of the subcommittee. It's not the same three members that are there now. On August 21st, all of these policies, including those 18, were emailed to the board and publicly posted, because we always publicly post these in case the public has questions. And on August 25th, there was only eight of us, as there are today, um, and it got four yeses to pass from the people who sit on the floor and four noes from those at the dais. And that's why it got sent back to subcommittee. We pulled those 18 out, and that is what we'll talk about later tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Ms. Thurston. Well, first off, Michelle, I just wanted to come over and give you a great big hug. My heart is breaking for you and for Scott. So I, I'm sending you, my, I'm sending you hugs. I am so sorry. Um, Scott, you took my Marine Corps birthday announcement. I have one. I have a Marine sitting at home watching. I will get my hands slapped if I don't say happy birthday to the Marine Corps. Um, you know, tomorrow is Veterans Day. I know Tina and I were talking about a former colleague and you know, this day was so important to him and he was so proud for the time that he served. And um, I've just been thinking a lot about him and his family. So, um, like Chris said, when you see a veteran, thank you for your service. Um, and if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't we wouldn't be here. And you know, being raised by a former Marine, that is not something I ever take for granted. So thank you for everything, and happy Veterans Day. Thank you, Miss Hall. about because we're being told that statewide there are actually fewer students in schools than there were. And I'm jumping to the conclusion that homeschooling has somewhat to do with this. Do you know how many or have there been a number of registrations of homeschools relating to the COVID? Yes, I know as a district, we've had, and, and I don't want to say a number out loud, I don't, and I know Kathy's watching and she knows the exact number, um, 
but I, we, I've had mo many families reach out to me either over the summer or even when we made the decision um, to stay in the format that we were that formally withdrew their students and, and, and continued on a formal homeschooling plan. We do have a number of them. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I know once I get them, as soon as they email me, I get them right to Kathy because I know Kathy will get the paperwork to them quicker than I will. But yes, I, it, it's definitely more than one. Reading the state regulations on this, I noticed that you could require these parents to provide you with a portfolio of the work that their children are doing. Have you ever done that? Yes. And you, yes. Um, there is a, a change in, apparently, scheduling, maybe, I'm not quite clear, in something that I can't comprehend, and I wonder where this quadrant division concept comes from, because in what I'm reading, what it sounds like is a classroom not only has separated students, but these are the room is divided into four parts. And theoretically, that would, according to the description that has been publicized, would mean that if one student in one of the quadrants had COVID or symptoms or whatever, that only the group in that quadrant would be required to quarantine. And since most classrooms do not have multiple doors, which would allow each quadrant to go their own separate direction. I don't see how that could possibly create any advantage in the description that's going. Are you any more aware of what's going on than I am? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, I don't believe that I'm qualified to comment on with the quadrant system that might be taking place in the district other than I don't know who their fire marshals are, but I'd be curious on their opinion on that as well. Um, the last comment or not question, well, maybe it's a question. Have you, you have extended our hybrid learning through Thanksgiving? Have you, because of what's been going on publicly, state and national, national wide, considered extending it through the end of the year? I, I, haven't, I think we've considered everything based on, on the data that presents itself almost on a daily basis. Um, as I said earlier, um, Obviously, this decision to remain in this in, in this current format is through Thanksgiving. Um, I sh shared my concerns for the week after, you know, preceding Thanksgiving. Um, again, not because it's of anyone's fault, but there are going to be. I'd rather find out now that people are going to be forced to quarantine for travel. Uh, you know, I don't want to say violations because you are allowed to travel, but you can't go anywhere once you're home if you travel. Um, and I think that will garner what the next phase of the decision is. I, know, I did hear Mr. LeBlanc reference. There's a, you're going to hear more and more throughout the state other districts that are making more long-term decisions. Uh, he referenced two. Um, well, what one that I'm intimately familiar with, um, and there's actually the neighboring town which I'm intimately familiar with as well. It's Seymour and Shelton. They're both currently 100% distance learning. Uh, Shelton made the decision today to go to January 1st. Uh, Hamden was proposing to go all the way through Martin Luther King Day. Um, I don't know if I'm there yet <laughs> as far as that type of distance. I think I'm trying to right now, let's figure out how we're going to handle that week after Thanksgiving, it's merely from a staffing perspective. And then, you know, also we have to digest the, the public health data that's shared with us. Um, there are a lot of conversations throughout the state. Um, and I don't think the state has taken an official position yet. And I say that because I had a call with um, the state health directors this morning um, and they referenced the call about that they had with the CDC. They've actually requested an opinion from CDC with regards to Thanksgiving break, uh, but they have yet to give them a formal opinion. Um, so I don't think the state is going to give us a formal opinion on what that duration is. I know there's a lot of concern around Thanksgiving in the, in the week 
after that and possibly the following week. But that time between Thanksgiving and Christmas or New Year's, um, I think everyone's trying to gather as much data as close to that date as we can. So that was a long answer. To, yeah, we're considering everything. <laughs> like I said, I want to keep us open as long as I can. And I, and I have to, again, would it surprise me at some point that we're told you can't do it anymore? You got to shut down for a period of time? No, I mean, I'm just being truthful. I think they've told us since the beginning at the state level, have, the reason that they had to give us three plans, in per, full in-person, hybrid, and remote, and they were very upfront with us in the beginning, make sure you have your remote plans up and running, which is why I scrambled to you guys to get iPads in every kid's hands, because they said there's an expectation at some point during the school year, we hope it's not as the duration like it was in the spring, but there's gonna be some point where you're gonna be forced to go remote for a period of time. And unfortunately, a lot of the things that we've heard from these people have come true. They told us when you get to the colder months, you're gonna start seeing an increase in cases. You're gonna start seeing kids having to be quarantined more. Everything that they told us back in the summer when it didn't seem feasible has come to fruition. So I'm hoping they're wrong on this latest one, but we'll keep, we'll keep doing what we can to stay open. As far as Head Start is concerned, we have a report for Ben. We'll discuss that when we get to new business. The Kite, like I hope it is, has put out a new community resource guide, which includes food sources, COVID testing, and rent and mortgage relief, along with their what they have previously distributed. And if you haven't seen it or gotten it, just let me know and I'll email it to you. And in the subject of entertaining fundraising, um, ERFC is going to be celebrating National Cupcake Day on December 15th. And to help you celebrate, they've made arrangements with some very well-known, but not by me, cupcake <laughs> source <laughs> that will allow you to buy cupcakes by the six pack from now until December 11th. That's how that got. And then you can pick them up on the 15th at ERFC. Headquarters in the in the end is an extra attempt to intrigue you and want you to get other than sounding wonderful cupcakes. You have an opportunity that over time three random cupcakes will feature a bronze, silver, or gold ticket under them and there are prizes associated with each color. So, and you get, if you go to the ERC website, you can have a choice of types of what cupcakes you want. Some of them sound absolutely delicious. So enjoy. And the ERC always has entertaining fun reasons is another one. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Ms. LeBlanc. Sure. Um, so um, Mr. LeBlanc and Ms. Hall asked um, a couple of the questions I had about the subbing. As I'll start with you, Mr. Jezik. <laughs> um, uh, as far as the subbing was going to go, because I sent, I was going to ask if there had been changes since the new guidelines came out regarding the high school diploma, but um, I'm thinking that with the recent spikes in COVID, it's going to be less and less even and, and more challenging. So you don't have to answer that because you answered it, but that was one of my questions I wanted to put out there. Um, I feel like at, at the high school level, I'm hearing uh, you know more and more kids opting out and going remote um, for fear of, of COVID as the numbers climb. Um, and I, I know that the class sizes there are getting um, extremely low. And you know, there's a question out there, you know, does Enfield High go fully remote? Um, but I know based on what you said, if the students are still attending, we're still gonna teach them in person because that's the optimal experience for them to at least see their teacher 
face to face two days a week. Um, and I'll circle back to that when I talk about my board member comments. Um, I just want to um, also ask you, because I find this very interesting and I find conflicting things, and I'm probably talking to you like you're Dr. Fausti on this one, um, but I feel like you have a lot of knowledge on this. I can throw it, much better than him. <laughs> it's very confusing to me. I think you're close in age, though. <laughs> it's very confusing to me <laughs> that there is a quarantine that you're supposed to be in. And then there's some situations like work situations or whatnot that say, or like if you travel and you come back and you have a negative test, then you can like return back to work. And I find that very misleading because I feel like you can have a negative test and three days later you start symptoms and you're positive. And I think the symptoms are most, or are there um, your most contagious different reports say almost 48 hours. And I don't understand because I find that so conflicting um that 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 would be an option like to me if you are a close contact stay home for 14 days so or if you're you're quarantined or if you travel to one of those states i could see where that would be a little bit but the close contact i, I don't get that but I guess throw another wrinkle in that if you're positive yourself you only have to quarantine for 10 days yeah i don't understand that I, what they gave us <laughs> yeah right. so I, I don't know if that's more of a comment or a, like we just had a little venting session about the confusion that i have and i think that creates a lot of confusion for kids who have been identified as a close contact you know thinking that the negative tests would be okay and then um so anyway that's more of my comment and then thank you for giving us um a snapshot of what's actually happening like with the numbers in the school um I, I just want to, you know, thank the teachers and the administrators, and not even just the teachers. You know, the paras, the lunch ladies. Um, that kind of stuff is what makes our district great. And I can't imagine what you're going through, um, because it's it was hard before, and it's getting harder now. Um, but I am proud of you, and I support you as much as I can from where I am. And. Um, it's appreciated more than you'll ever know by students and um, parents. So it's, I know that it's easy to focus on the negative sometimes. Um, and a little fun fact, I have teachers in my family, a first grade teacher in another town, a third grade teacher in another town, a fifth grade special ed teacher in another state. Um, so I talk to them daily because I'm very close to them and so, um, I, I feel for, for them too. So just know that as hard as it gets, um, you are appreciated. So um, I wanna say that since you both are here and you can carry that message along. Um, the other people I wanna thank, and this is kind of going on to my board member comments, so Mr. Dozik's off the hook, I believe, um, is I wanna thank the bus drivers because we're always you know, thanking the teachers and um, because we appreciate them. Um, but the bus drivers have been great as well. Um, some of them made a, a funny little TikTok video on a Wednesday and they were all cleaning their buses and, and doing their Wednesday clean thing and, and I thought that was uh, great for them. So thank you bus drivers because um, you're out in, on the front line and, and dealing with the kids as well. Um, for Mrs. Dupuy and her family, um, I, I want to express my sincere condolences to them. I did not have the honor or privilege of knowing her or having one of my students have her. Um, but based on the outpouring from um, fellow teachers and former students and parents, um, Mrs. Dupuy made Enfield Public School a wonderful place to learn at, especially at Hazardville Memorial. So I want to send my sincere condolences to Mrs. Dupuy's family. Um, I just want to say this too. I went to a memorial for Elijah Swanson, who passed on Saturday. I went in the capacity of a mom. I went because my daughter asked me to. I didn't go as a board member. Um, when a tragedy happens in this town, we can say a lot about Enfield, but Enfield really knows how to come together. And although it was a sad day, it restores your faith in humanity. It was a day filled of love and remembrance. And um, one of the things that uh, Enfield Little League did was they put, um, they painted Elijah's number in left field because that was his position. And then they painted his 
um, number at home plate, and they had former um, coaches and players um, speak, and one of them had same, saved a letter that he had written to his coach in Enfield High. He had an assignment. You had to pick somebody influential, and he wrote to this coach, and this coach saved the letter and read it. Um, and because baseball was one of Elijah's favorite things, instead of doing the 21 gun salute at the end, they did a 26 hit salute. And using his bat, uh, 26 of his former players and coaches um, hit a ball. And a lot of them went out into left field. So it was very touching and it was a very beautiful day. And um, it, those types of gatherings um, really make me proud to be um, a member of Enfield, Connecticut, and to see um, form, a lot of former students, a lot of or former Enfield Public School students and stuff. It was it was amazing to see. So I wanted to to say that. Um, I also want to mention that I went to a parent teacher conference um, via Zoom. If I can make a recommendation for you guys, I usually don't do parent teacher conferences at the high school because it's almost like people might not get this. Well, we're all older, so we'll remember like trying to get a concert ticket free off a of 96.5 TIC to try to get a parent-teacher conference in because there was only so many slots in person. I think being able to go forward to have like a Zoom option would allow more parents to get those parent-teacher conferences. And they're a little shorter, but um, it was amazing. And um, the teacher really enjoyed it. And we were her first one of the day and there were no glitches. So I don't think that's a bad option going forward if we offered some in person and some on Zoom. I don't know, but I thought that was great. Um, I also uh, attended the safe grad meeting and I told them I would um, I would let you guys know that there is some events coming up in the month of December they're going to be selling calendars and each day you buy a calendar for ten dollars and each day um, you're eligible they're gonna pull a live pri a prize live on Facebook and um, more details will follow I'll get more information in December they're gonna start I have to look at the update because um, because this is this is where I have the information on this one. So Wooden Tap is finally opening here in Enfield. I don't know if anybody knows that it's been delayed. And Wooden Tap picks a group to help fundraise, and they selected Enfield Safe Grad, which I think is great because um, they are trying to raise money in unprecedented times. And we don't even know if they'll have you know a Safe Grad. So uh, this fundraiser is going to be um, November 20th and 21st, and you go to the link. And um, it, everything is going to be co adherence to strict COVID guidelines. You can buy tables of two, four, and six. Um, and they even have um, information on how they're going to keep you safe. So um, that's November 20th and the 21st. So look on the Enfield High Parents page, or the Enfield High Safe Grad page, or your friends that have seniors this year are going to be sharing that. So that's something to consider. Um, one of the things uh, Mr. LeBlanc had talked about was mental illness, and that is such a concern this time of year. It, it's always a concern this time of year, and, and you add COVID to it. So um, I definitely think that's something that, that we need to keep an eye on. And um, actually, last week, I believe Enfield High sent out an email um, talking about that and, and being there to support the students. Um, veterans. Uh, I'll thank you for being a veteran and giving Liz and giving me the freedom that I have today to be sitting up here and thank you for fighting for that. Um, as far as the speakers go, I appreciate you all coming out tonight. Um, I don't think that what the policy committee is putting out for a first reading is representing my thoughts on what policy should be in the policy book. And I feel very strongly about that. So, um, Hopefully I get a chance to speak to that later on, but I appreciate you coming out and speaking to that because as elected officials, um, we represent all students. So that's all I have. Anyone else? Mr. Salazar, do you wanna go? Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to reclaim some of my time from earlier. Um, I, I think it's important to mention that as uh, chair of the policy subcommittee, um, we do have 
quite a few policies that we're putting forth that we're submitting. And, and these are not all new policies. Many of these have already been in existence that address some of the concerns that were brought up by the audience today. And um, if you allow me, I'd like to just highlight a couple, or well, not a couple, but a few. We have a policy uh, that we're putting forth uh, for homeless students. We have a policy that we're putting forth um, dealing with hazing, with bullying. We have a policy for dress and groom. We have a policy for administering medication to students. We have a policy that we're putting forth for students with special health care needs, food allergy management, uh, for reporting child abuse and neglect, for suicide prevention. We have a policy for student sports, specifically concussions and head injuries. Um, and we have a policy for non-discrimination that we're putting forth as well. There's also a policy for sexual abuse prevention and then in an education program to go along with that. Perhaps conspicuously, conspicuously missing from these policies is the one pertaining to transgender students. And in, in all honesty, whether I personally feel that a transgender student should have the right to use the bathroom of his choice or her choice or participate in a sport as a transgender student, it's, it's truly a moot point because uh, those protections are already provided by the state. Um, that's already in code and we have to, as a school district and as a town, we have to abide by the protections that are already provided by the state and even the, the federal government. So I just wanted to clarify that. And then one other point that was, I think was mentioned and uh, my colleague here, uh, Jonathan was trying to address is in fact, we are not removing any policies that were in existence. Were there some policies that were published in a website and submitted for review and reading? Yes. Are those being excluded? Yes, but they were not part of the uh, Enfield Public Schools policy book. So I just wanted to take a moment to clarify. Thank you. Anyone else want to go before me? So I always go backwards, so we're going to start with today. Yes, we are missing a Republican on this dais and applications do not go through the town. They go through the, the each individual party. So if it's a Dem slot, it goes through the Dem Democrat Party. If it's a Republican slot, it goes through the Republican Party. So so applications have to could be submitted through the Republican Party committee. Yesterday there was the council sitting at these tables and we were told that uh, Councillor Kiner is retiring, so I want to give him uh, thank you for his service. I worked with him on the Joint Facilities Committee for a year, and he and he will be missed. And for all his years of service in town, thank you very much, Councillor Kiner. We also found out last night that uh, the town was uh, approving some changes to our local parks with basketball courts and, and also including some growing um, areas for, for growing, which I guess is very popular in town. So I want to thank the town for that. Um, do want to push, and I'm going to push this now almost every meeting. I sat at this dais more than three years ago, and I was promised by our state reps at the time for a traffic light at, at Field High. Crickets. So now that the election's over, I'm pushing them again. You got a year. Before next November, I want at least a plan or something to get that traffic light installed. There is traffic lights going up all over the state for no reason. They're, they're taking new ones down and putting new ones up. But we can't get one on Enfield High when we were promised it. And I announced it at this meeting. So our state reps, all three of them, get on the ball, get it done. So we go backwards again. So uh, I, I missed the, uh, well, as it, it was a today, I missed the um, 
gathering for Ms. Dupuy. I, I apologize. I had another commitment, but we are we are so sorry for the loss. It was she was a great teacher, as I was as I was told. Thank you, Mr. Ryder, for representing all of us at the at the uh, occasion today. So thank you for that. Um, Sunday there was the uh, gathering on the green for the veterans. Thank you to all our veterans. Semper Fi to the Marine Corps today for their anniversary. And thank you to all our veterans, because without them, we couldn't be here tonight. So so we back up to Election Day, a week ago. I want to thank all the people that came out and voted. Even the ones I was I started over at the senior center, then I went over to Enfield Street School and I it was cold. I don't know why they made it in the back of the school where the wind was blowing across the river, but that's another discussion and I'll bring it up with the registers at, a, at another time. But traffic was horrendous there, but it, you know, we had a great turnout. It was a lot of people turnout. How is this relevant to the board of ed meeting? Talking about the election is not Don't interrupt me, please. I didn't interrupt you. Please don't interrupt me. I'll get to it. This is my time. I can speak. I let everybody else spoke. This is my time. I speak. Three minutes. You should have the same. No, sorry. Yeah, listen, you drone on for hours. Stop, please. I'm talking. You know, forget it. Thank you very much. Unfinished business number 10. We have none? Nope. Number 11. Approve fiscal year 2020 Federal Health Start Grant. Do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Ms. Hall, seconded by Ms. Mr. Ryder. Uh, we do have the, the uh, oh shoot. We do have it in our packet. Yes, I promised you last meeting that you would have more money. Yes, yes, you did. And, and this is the federal grant that I warned you about. If you want to go ahead and give us the details, Ms. Hall, you may. I don't know that we all need all of the details, but what you have received is in summary the amount that the program will allow, uh, could potentially, assuming everything was passed on the federal level as well. $850,000 is the amount, most of which, as one would expect, is for personnel costs. In addition to that, you've received a great deal of information about the goals for Head Start, and I want to refresh your memory that Head Start has many, many rules at the federal level that require them to cover all of these goals and establish them annually, develop them as a group, and actually make them work. And if you would, we have added new programs this year, which one of which the Rosy, Rosy Reader part that was in last meetings is for, for, for Head Start and the Never Early Childhood Assessment for Preschoolers is the next one in the last page in your, uh, in the report for this meeting. And as a result, if our um, um, if the motion is passed, Chairman Purcell has a document to sign. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Any other discussion, Mr. LeBlanc? Um, <clears throat> I would just like to thank uh, Ms. Jacqueline Valley. Um, I did have a couple questions in regards to this report that was sent out to us, and. She went above and beyond clarifying uh, some of the concerns I had. Um, the one thing, this is uh, in relation to this to go out to the community, one thing they're really trying to increase is um, a partnership, um, a school readiness program that is a partnership for families to engage in. 
the numbers are pretty well for, particip for families participating in one event, but then it goes down drastically um, it, when considering multiple events. And I know they want to get the numbers up to 85% participation by the family. So this is just a encouragement to our families in town to um, be involved in that. And if you do one, do two, do three, they're good. And um, so just a little FYI to the community on that. But on the I, other hand, the daily attendance in the system is great. Mm -hmm. And the, and the numbers too in in relation to um, child development, considering even COVID, you know, having an impact on that all, are still pretty extraordinary. So, extraordinarily well. So, thank you to uh, Mrs. Valley. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Any other discussion? I just had a question, Walter. Yes, please, Mr. Mr. Uh, Ms. Hall, just, just one question. I, I did go through this and um, just quickly, and I read over the application for the Head Start, and I see here under the budget categories that um, the amount captured for the, for the budget itself at 857000 which you referenced, but there's another category there. It's called the non-federal share, 251000 some of it is ours. Okay, that's. The, I was just wondering where. What, what was that? What is that? Well, we provide space, among other things, is that, and transportation, no. and yeah, whatever. no, no, not, not for what it's for. I'm just thinking, what, what, what does it come from? Is that part? Is that coming from A the BOE budget? Yes. Yeah, that part of the program, the board has to supplement parts of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. I went to the BOE budget and look through to see if that was itemized in there. I just didn't see it broken out at the 251,000 level. So I was just wondering where it was coming from, but. Well, that would be because the current, it's in the current budget. This would be the one moving forward. Mm -hmm. So it would be a different figure, but there is, there is appropriations in our budget to offset some of the Head Start costs. Okay, so part of it is, you know, the federal budget and then we make a contribution as well. Yes, Good. and there's also state grants that Ms. Hall referenced last meeting. I will say that some of the new members are spoiled. Um, and because of the information you have in front of you, because this is probably the most comprehensive I've ever seen this grant in a number of years. Uh, and that echoes the sentiment of Mr. Mr. LeBlanc. Jacqueline's just awesome. <laughs> okay. So this is, even for those who don't understand this stuff, it's a heck of a lot easier to understand it because Jacqueline probably didn't sleep for like 12 nights to put this together. Good, thank you. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Salazar? Four. Mrs. Thurston? Definitely. Mr. Ungar? A four. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Chairman Krizel? Yes. Thank you. 11B, approval of 5000 series policy, first reading. Mr. Uh, do I have a motion? I make a motion. Make motion by Mr. Salazar? Second by. Second. Second by Mr. Ungar. Any discussion? We'll start with Mr. Salazar. Well, Mr. Uh, Chairman and other members of the board, this is the um, this is the fruit of the several meetings that we've had in the uh, policy committee regarding the 5,000 uh, series policies. Um, my approach has been to. Uh, review and accept those that we are required to accept, to allow, most definitely, because there's no reason why they shouldn't be, to allow those policies that were previously in the books that are even those that are just recommended and not required to continue to stay. And um, I believe that this approach is going to give us the most uh, effective, efficient, and um, proactive way of addressing all of the policies in including the 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, and 9,000 that we still have left to review. So um, I believe it's a pretty comprehensive package. Uh, some new ones are included. All of the ones in the books are continue to be in the books. And um, I, I think it allows for the administration to very effectively carry out his, his work. So. 
Mr. Salazar, can I ask a question yes, on your Ms. last Hall. statement? Yes, Ms. Hall. You said the ones in the book are still in the book. What book? The policy book. Um, the Enfield policy book? Correct. So that these policies None of the are... If I, if I may, I think I, I think I understand what you're asking. Um, so there are policies that we are being asked to review that were not required, but recommended. But those had been previously adopted. And uh, they, they've been adopted in years past from 2009, actually back to 94, 2014. So those policies continue to stay. We're not removing those, which was a In the 5,000 series. Correct. So that the package we're voting on tonight is an addition to what already exists or replaces the 5,000 series with this set of policies? No, it's an addition to what already exists. We're not removing any policies that already exist. That is an... The answer is B. This 5,000 series that was emailed to us to vote on this evening will replace the current 5,000 series. So theoretically, if we had 30 in the 5,000s before, tonight's 30 are what we're voting on. Those are all the 5,000s posted on the Enfield Public No, Mr. Website. Challenger. But, but, not not he, what we were told. Mr. Ryder just stated the, the, uh, I the know answer. I we have, you know, 6,000, 4,000, what have you. But my understanding, what I was told was that what we're voting on tonight is the 5,000 series. Not additions to the 5,000 series, but this will be the 5,000 series. And, and what I'm saying in addition to that is that any policy that was already in existence is not being removed. Mr. Longy, is that correct? Yeah, I, I think it's, I think you all may be saying the same thing, I think. So it, it is confusing because um, I think this is the third policy committee that's been on the 5,000s. So it's been a long haul. So. Uh, different groups have looked at this differently and COVID was a big reason I believe that it didn't get approved before um, but we are sitting here what was sent to you by Kathy is the most current 5,000 series that this it's subcommittee the old 5,000 series I, I'm not sure what you mean by the old 5,000 this is oh, so if you one. if you take our current 5,000 series that we have right now that was last adopted by the board this is now would replace the 5000 series that are currently that we use. So right now, when our administrators need to go to the 5000s or when parents need to go to 5000s, it is the old 5000s is the best way to say it because okay. there's been several of them. This you would be voting on right now for the first reading of the new 5,000 series. So there are no other 5,000 series, assuming we approve this group? That's correct. This is the that only- That is not what I believe okay. Mr. Salazar said. Right, Because, and I see what you're saying. I think, Joyce, what you're saying is we've had other policy sections that were so large that we were sending them to you in a chunk at a time. Exactly. Okay, I'm with you now. This 5,000 series is, is start to finish, the 5,000 series that you're voting on for a first reading. There are no other 5,000 series. There's no other 5,000 series that'll come your way. But Currently, there are 37 policies posted in the 5,000 series on the EnfieldSchools.org website. So those 37 aren't going away, but those 37 are incorporated in today's packet with some exceptions. But what we're voting on tonight is this new quote unquote, new 5,000s, new and improved, will replace what is currently on the website. So I stand by what I said. There are policies that Not were 5, in existence. Not 5,000 numbered policies. There are 5,000 numbered policies that were previously in existence that are included in these policies being put forth. But this new group that we're talking about, however it may have changed or not, is the 5,000 series going and forward, it's a, assuming it's passed correct. at the two meetings involved. Correct. I asked this question to Kathy, and the way she made it sound like, and I'm just going to spit a number out there. If there's a 5125 in our existence now, but it's not in this packet, that 5125 stays. No. 
That's the way she made it sound like. Well, we did we did go over all of the uh, ones that were previously adopted, and we left those there, which are included in the new packet. I, I think what can be confusing at times is part of what CABE does for us, the, what you guys pay for, is uh, CABE hasn't looked at our policies in a very long time. It's a service that, for whatever reason, several boards ago decided with budget reasons, decided not to carry CABE. Because of that, our numbers are pretty outdated. So what CABE does is they make sure the numbers line up statewide. So if uh, anyone can look up any type of policy and statewide, the numbers should match up. Our numbers didn't match up very well because they were so outdated. So they would take a policy, and a lot of times it would be the same policy, but they would just give it the proper number. So it's confusing, and I apologize. Not, it's confusing. Not the number of them, but the number in the title of which it is called, like 512.3. Yeah, might, might sh should now be 5235, but it's the same exact title. It's the same exact policy. Sure. So it, there is a chance, it, and it is confusing. Trust me. It, I, I liaison, of the, liaison of the policy, it can be confusing at times because sometimes you match up the old policy number and you say well where is that policy number it, that's through cabe's function of making sure that we're on the same page as the rest of the state and if that a, helps a little there's an example to what you stated there's a policy 5124.1 that used to be number 2112.12 that policy was adopted in 2008. same policy same policy mr leblanc yes. Yes, we made the motion, and now we're discussing. Yes, Bill made the motion. John. Bill made the motion. Mr. LeBlanc. So, in relation to what you're speaking of, five five one one eight point one in the packet we were sent is titled or P five one one eight point one A is titled homeless students. That's in the packet we received in our emails. Correct? Yes. Right. It should be. It should be. Right. So, but when we looked at a recommended policy, it's a, it's a number different, but it's the same same concept. Well, that policy will so work. Sorry, go ahead, please. So is this in relation to what you're talking about? Where the numbers are just switched up now, but it's the same policy? Correct. Okay. Mr. Ryder. <clears throat> so once again, the 5000 series passed through the subcommittee on August 10th with what we received most recently, what we're voting on this evening, and it also had 18 additional policies that were removed. But to the public's view, they were emailed to us on August 21st. They didn't pass due to a tie at the Board of Ed meeting on August 25th. Sent back to subcommittee, circle round and round. Now we're back to November 2nd policy subcommittee meeting where all 18 of these failed two votes to one. And the titles of these, and I know titles can be misleading, um, but here's one, 5118.2, Educational Opportunities for Military Children. I referenced Lori Gates earlier, who's somebody that isn't red or blue. Everybody seems to think she's a good person. And I said, you're a military family. What did you think of this? She said, I was able to do a split screen of the proposed policy and what I had to go through looking at like army.gov and all the other things that I had to look through for my family. My first huge takeaway is that the EPS proposed policy is far easier to read and understand than the state's. It's in layman's terms, my personal history with military spouses, et cetera. This EPS model kind of cuts to the chase and spells things out clearly while covering all the same things the state does. So yes, it's a duplication of what's already a state law, but excusing it because it's a state law when this could help potentially a family so the shorter answer is I absolutely agree. This is important to add. It, it's something that's easier for the parent of a military student or the spouse to find. To somebody's point earlier, the 5,000 policies are, to me as a parent, 
the most important chunk because this deals with student affairs, how we want our students to act, how we discipline them when on occasion they step over that line. And I don't want the administrators to reach for a Connecticut state law book when Timmy pushes Sally over at the playground instead of our handbook. I mean, again, titles are misleading, but uh, children of foster care, educational opportunities for military children, uh, out of school grounds misconduct, uh, policies for pregnant students. It explains that they have the opportunity to get a tutor, to come back. Yes, by the state law, they have all these rights still. But why wouldn't you want them in the handbooks? Why wouldn't you want us to feel welcoming to anybody? I don't even have to go down the political path when I can point to something like <laughs> educational opportunities for military students. I, w what happened is we had a resignation in, in August. This would have been voted on then. This would all be put to bed. One of the board members resigned who was on the policy committee who agreed with myself, because these things all passed in a previous incarnation of the policy committee, two to one. There was one person that dissented from that vote. He's the one person now in charge of the subcommittee, and this one person shouldn't get to choose for 5,200 children what we do. Like, we should discuss this in a larger, we should discuss these in a larger sense than just even, even the three of us. Even the three of us that are on the subcommittee. These are too important. Again, invasion of privacy for students, freedom of speech and expression, uh, sexual harassment. Again, the transgender nonconforming youth. That policy is several pages long. You know what it's filled with? Definitions. Mm -hmm. What does this mean? What, what if a student says, I'm this, I'm cis, I'm, you know, like, it, it's basically just eight or nine pages of definitions of, we're not the same. They're, they're, it's not just boy, girl, like there's, there's differences. So now here we are, bring it full circle. We're back to the 5,000s again, but what I call, I call it the 5,000 light, 18 less calories, 18 less policies. And, and again, most of these, they're just nice to have. They're gonna make certain groups feel more welcome. They're gonna give parents a guide to go to. They're gonna, I mean, off school misgrounds conduct, basically it just says, Hey, kids, if you're going to an away football game, act there like you would at school. The same way we'd want you to act at, at Enfield High, down the hill, watching a football game. Don't go spray painting the next town over's bridge if we win the game. Act like, you know, the blanket statement of if it's not mandated, we don't have it and we don't even discuss it is not fair to our students or to our administrators. I. Mr. Salazar said, we are, we're overburdening our admins with all of these rules. We're not in this case, because in this series, they want to know black and white. If I get called into the school because my son did something, I'm gonna say, show me where it says he can't do that. You know, sorry he did it, but where, where does it say that? Well, I can't, but let me get you this Connecticut law book and I'll show you here. Sorry, Ms. Dupuy. Um, so uh, these need to be larger discussions that's where I stand on it. Those are the facts. Those are the dates. That's what was taken out. You can say that they were never real, so they're not really being taken out, but people saw them. I got questions. I ask the questions. I go to an LBGTQ family and I ask them questions. I go to a military family and say, how does this work? I do my research. I do my homework. I show up to these meetings prepared with questions, with highlights. I'm the longest standing member on this subcommittee and I take it damn serious. I've been on there for three years. Mr. Salazar has been there for a year. Mr. Ungar has been there for a minute and a half. I respect them, but I just disagree with them on this. And I just wanted everybody to know how I feel about it. So when this passes or doesn't pass, I can sleep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Blank. Yeah, so I went through the policies that we're not gonna include. And I don't know if anybody decided to go through the policies and see how many Connecticut state statutes make up one page and a half document. The off school grounds misconduct, there's 13 state statutes and three court cases. So I don't think that's helping an administrator at all because in the long run, we're gonna need legal opinion because 
I can't go to a Connecticut state statute and make heads or tail of it. I'm not an attorney. Connecticut state ta statutes aren't easy to read. If you take time to read this off school grounds misconduct, it's extremely important that when our kids go to other towns, there are ramifications with threatening a student, brandishing a weapon, that cover this in this policy. So that when the argument becomes, well, my student wasn't at Enfield High, Henry Barnard, any of these places, it's against our policy. And it's against policy 5131.AA. It's short-sighted, it's intolerant, and it doesn't, what's coming out of the policy committee does not fairly represent how other board members are feeling. It should be discussed. These, these policies protect they don't tie our hands up in red tape. This isn't big government. More than likely, recommended policies are coming from a school district that have had these issues and are saying, look, these are some recommended policies that might fit well in your district. And yes, some of the recommended policies don't fit into the Enfield Public Schools thumbprint, but some do, and they should be addressed. And I'm concerned because the next 6,000 series is instruction. And these, these decisions in the policy committee directly affect students and staff. And I don't care how families choose to raise their kids or how families, uh, how I raise my kids, I have a right to look at every policy and protect every student that comes to Enfield Public Schools. And honestly, I'm not gonna lie, the transgender policy really was a big learning experience for me because of the vocabulary in there. And I was appreciative of that. And um, if you read this off school <laughs> grounds misconduct, it should be no brainer. And then to see that you would have to go through 13 Connecticut general statutes to get the same information. To get the same information. And, and it talks about use of a firearm, deadly weapon, dangerous instrument, martial arts possession of um, drugs, violent conduct, making a bomb threat, threatening to harm or kill another student or member of a staff, why wouldn't you want that in there? Even if the incident occurred or was initiated off school grounds and non-school time, that is important because they are our students all the time, especially when they go to another school district. They are. I can't tell you how many coaches my kids have had that said Eagle Pride on and off the field before and after school represent this school well. Threats of violence. To me, this is simple. Something that I wouldn't even blink an eye at, including. That's it for now. Any other discussion? Mr. Yeah, Salazar. Yeah, something. Well, we did have, um, yeah, I don't know how, how to say it, but uh, independent of what some other members might feel that there was no conversation to be had, there was plenty of opportunity to have these conversations in the subcommittee. And, and I do recall them very clearly, one of the members of the subcommittee saying it wasn't worth it to discuss that. So because it had been said over and over and over in other meetings that are posted, they were recorded, okay. they were virtual, we can go watch them. So, so when, it, when it's time to have the conversations, Mr. Ryder, it's, it's the time to bring these issues up. And I, real, I realize that you feel, okay, well, if I can't, if I can't speak, I, I yield my time, thank you. Mr. Salazar has the floor, please. I'll, I'll, I'll just I finish. I broke my gavel, so I'll just keep I'll just finish with, uh, the, the policy committee is the place to have the conversations and, and those meetings take place and the conversations take place. And uh, yes, there are only three members that get to vote. The vote is not always going to satisfy even every member of the committee. So it's the way the, you know, the, the, the system works. But the conversations are had in the policy committee. Maybe it should satisfy Please, no comments, please. These conversations comments. were had. <coughs> I was ignored, so I said I would talk to you again on camera. Ms. Hall. This was a motion. It is open for discussion. 
Yes. And that discussion can include what is not here but was recommended just as discussing what's already in the list. And I have a couple of other, not as dramatic as the transgender one, but a couple of other policies that have been omitted that based on my experience in education for many years, I find to be very important. And I related the off-school grounds misconduct with the freedom of speech and expression for students, because those two seem to me to be related, although the numbers don't agree with that. But freedom of speech and delineating for a student, because remember, schools become in locus parental, is important for a student to know what is allowed or not allowed if they are, for example, writing for a school newspaper or any other written purpose relating to the school. And to know that it should not contain libelous or obscene language, students sometimes get carried away. And nationally, there have been cases where student newspapers have been removed from schools and students suspended because of what they wrote. And having that clarified in a policy referring to freedom of speech and expression is important, just as the behavior off school grounds is important and has resulted in many cases, the off ground activity with lawsuits because students have misbehaved. I'm not saying that any of it came happened in Enfield because I don't remember all the nitty gritty details but I do know within the state of Connecticut, there have been serious issues about conduct of students off school grounds. A student, another policy, 5141.251, these numbers are horrendous. Students with special health care needs. I remember, as a board member, sitting through lengthy discussions with parents on the subject of peanut butter because a student who was coming into school had a very serious allergy and we had to deal with that and it took a bit of lengthy discussions to come up with the final decisions on that but that is actually mentioned in our accommodating students with special dietary needs. It is not the primary sub subject of this particular policy because it's talking about those who have, must have a specific kind of food, not simply avoid peanut butter. But it is included in this and it is critical. We've had many problems with peanut butter and keeping schools clean. Now we spend most of our time keeping schools clean, but at that time, cleaning up when someone might have had peanut butter in the classroom that this child was going into was a critical issue. The first aid emergency medical care subdivision, sudden cardiac arrest prevention is another one that immediately came when I went, read through these, who were, which were not on our current group, as being very important because we have had students in a variety of places, not necessarily Enfield again, but students who have suddenly collapsed because someone did not notice that they'd either become overheated or something during an exercise and they did not survive. This has uh, details about sudden cardiac arrest prevention and is something that should be very important to all coaches in particular and should be part of our policies. A couple of the others have already been mentioned so I won't go over any more but that's the kind of thing that has meaning for a policy 
developed for a Board of Education. We need to know what to do under some of the worst circumstances, not just the best. Mr. LeBlanc. So before I go into discussion, because I did go through some of the policies and one that did catch my eye was the uh, the one in regards to the cardiac arrest and I actually wrote a uh, first aid and emergency care and it, I actually wrote down a question because I wanted to know they in that policy they talk about um, a cardiac arrest awareness education program regardless if that policy is in place or not that is something we as a school district do correct okay it, it, it is it was a question I had because it's something that I saw was written in the policy that you have the policy lays out that you have the sudden cardiac arrest awareness education program but without that policy we still are along the right. same lines At beginning of every year our nursing staff will train the staff on that okay. that's, that's procedures that's been happened for a long time all right oh, man, it just, <laughs> of course it resets itself anyways all right i'll try to go off of, off of what it said so i went through 18 recommended policies that were not looked at and i agree some are not needed some i think we could do without as i was going through the policies i was reading word for word what these policies were saying and i'm like okay and it's a lot of lingo a lot of governmental lingo that even doesn't make always sense to me and i'm like there's got to be a simpler way to try to understand what's going on here so all I would do is at the end of the recommended policy, I would look at the legal reference section. Some policies have one or two statutes that they're based off of. Pretty simple, right? That's that's manageable, I, I think I would call it, right? To, so maybe that's one that we don't necessarily need in our policy handbook because you can look up one or two Connecticut state general statutes and have a clear understanding of, of where it stands based on state law. As I kept going through the policies, I noticed that the legal references in a handful of them became extremely lengthy, sometimes half a page, a page. That to me, and I'll, that to, here, I'll give an example, and I, I lost it, so bear with me I'm gonna to try to go on memory there was one regarding student off-ground misconduct I think that was brought up the the one that caught the line that caught my attention was the last paragraph it wasn't even a paragraph it was sent one sentence and it related to students using either a gun or a deadly weapon I can't remember I, I believe the the policy said use the word gun firearm firearm okay firearm it used the word firearm and then in that joyce because i'm not going to be able to pull it up and find it in time Re can you read that last one a student who possessed and used a firearm deadly weapon dangerous instrument or martial arts weapon in the commission of a crime off campus shall be expelled for one calendar year unless said expulsion is modified on a case-by-case -case basis right so that one line caught my eye and then i looked as i was doing all the other policies at the legal references behind that and there were three or four legal references into firearms itself so i was to be honest with you i was trying to put myself in our administration's shoes and i was if i'm the administration and i have a, a student who violated if that was a policy to pet if that was a policy if i had a student violate that how do i understand where to go from there and then i'd look at if that was not in place i'd have to go look at the connecticut general statutes well that's when you're getting into a little bit of of research which 
and and law that isn't really in the job description of our administration. Therefore, I said, okay, that's that's becoming a little burdensome. There's not really clear clear guidance on on how to handle this given situation. So long story short, it, it, I battled back and forth with this one in full disclosure. To me, I it came down to how lengthy the legal references are and if they're manageable to understand or not. And on top of that, in particular, the misconduct one, it caught my eye that it gave a discipline to go along with that. If you were to just go off to Connecticut state statutes, there is no guidance on how to handle it on a disciplined basis. So for those two reasons, based on legal interpretation and some outline in student discipline, um, I, I have to I have to vote a certain way tonight on this, and I think that these need to be. And I, uh, again, I think I'll have to go through it again myself to to understand which ones I really, based on my reasoning, really need to be in this in a in a five thousand series packet, and which ones don't. I have to go do that, go back and do that again myself. And there are some that are not needed, and I'm sure. Unfortunately, politics is going to come and play a little bit with some of these, and and that's okay. But I at least, I, I think they need to at least be looked at uh, on that basis. So, when my vote, with my vote tonight, it comes down to the legal reference and if there is clear outlines on student discipline. That's it. Mr. Chair, may I ask Mr. LeBlanc a question? Go ahead. Have you been reading any state statutes recently? And that's where I said government lingo becomes a little crazy. Because if, if I think, if I'm thinking what you're thinking right now, state statutes are, people are lawyers for a reason. I'm not a it's lawyer. It's not just the fact that when you go to a state statute, the first thing you find is another reference which then will send you to another reference. So a clear, well-written state statute actually <laughs> is much more than just one single reference. Uh, and the clearness or the lack of it comes because they're modified every time the legislature meets. Not every statute, of course, but a significant number of them. So if the legislation was to pass an updated or ad adapted law based on our policy, we'd have to look at that legal reference. And then if, say, that legal reference that's highlighted in our policy book is changed, it's you would have to dig even. It's modified, yes. But that's where CABE comes in. <laughs> well, CABE comes in, but it doesn't, we got to understand too, it doesn't cover everything. And so, I think, again, I think it, this needs to come down to the legal references and how clear or not those legal references are, how much trouble it could give our administration if they're the ones who have to become a lawyer. The clarity of our policies so that not the administration but the families of students who might be in violation of or <clears throat> are the subject of because they have special needs or something else. Clarity for the families is much more important than knowing the state statute that might cover it. Because if they can read the policy and understand what is provided for their children, as Scott referenced military family, military children, it's all clear, but there is a statute involved, but it's only listed as one for that particular policy. Right. But the clarity of the policy and the way it's expressed is much more important than the fact that there's only one statute referenced. Mr. Ryder. So, like I said, this comes down to 
occasionally kids get in trouble. And occasionally, and I'm asking former administrators of schools, former high school principals, et cetera, sometimes you get that parent that comes in and they're gonna say, what did he do this time? And the principal is gonna explain, oh, we, he did this, this, and this. What if the parent says, show me where he can't do that? that that's my point. Like these things clarify things for families who read them, for the administrators who have to use them as law for their building. The, the principal is the president of that building. And these are their laws to run their building by. And I am certain on an occasion, you've had a parent come in a little hot <laughs> and said, show me that he couldn't do that or that she couldn't do that or she couldn't say that. And we're not handcuffing administration in this series specifically because this has to do with our kids. I get that argument, like Ms. LeBlanc said, for big government or make it political, et cetera. This is too important to have a blanket statement of if it is not a state law, if it is not legally required, it is my contention, we don't discuss it. That we've already whittled down what we will and will and won't discuss on the next series based on that philosophy. And I think using that philosophy as a blanket statement is doing a disservice to 5,200 kids, to their parents and guardians, and to the administrators and teachers and secretaries and custodians and every adult in our building that we ask to help raise our kids from nine to three every day. And that is all. Any other questions, Mr. Salazar? Uh, not, not, a, not a question, just a, an, an, another statement on my part. I, I think um, I'm, I'm not really uh, sure why <clears throat> These these particular ones are are so contentious, um, but they are, and ultimately, not every member of this board will come to agreement as to which ones will have to be in or not be in the in the policy book. Um, it is, I think, it's plainly obvious that that we're not going to have consensus in moving this um, these policies forward this evening. And, and that's fine. That's part of the process. And you know, it, anticipating the vote, I'll, I'll say, well, they'll, they'll be discussed again. Ultimately, votes are going to be taken. There are three members that vote, um, and so at, at some point in time, we have to realize two things: that there's a process that has to be followed, and, and I believe honestly that we do follow. Um, the conversations take place, discussions, if you will. Um, but ultimately, a vote has to be taken. And um, I don't know that, in all honesty, that we will ever reach a point where everyone's personal take or, yeah, personal take on, on which policies should be a part of the policy book um, is going to be satisfied. So that's, that's one statement. And the other one is that we need to take very, pay very close attention to each policy that is being requested to be reviewed again. I, I recall some famous words that are making the rounds uh, recently or made the rounds recently is you need to be careful of what you ask for because some of these policies are going to put, it is my strong belief, personal belief, that some of these policies are going to put us in a legal bind and uh, they're going to open us up to be in a position where we don't want to be as administrators and as a school board. That's all. Call the question. Call the question then. Well, she said call the question. I think we have to just. Roll call. What's the procedure? If we got to call the question, we have to roll call, correct? I was waiting. I was waiting. He did have his hand up before, so. Unless Joyce wants to rescind the. Do we have one more? Call. Just one more we'll comment, comment from Mr. That's up to her, though. Certainly. Okay, Mr. Ungar, then we call the question. No, thank you, and, and thank you, Ms. Hall. I was I was tr trying to get in Don't somewhere somewhere along the way here. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
So um, <clears throat> to Mr. Ryder's point, um, yes, I am relatively new to the policy committee. And so with that, um, I look at this and, and I'm trying to understand, you know, what's what's before us, what's before us here. And so I see. I see these policies and then I see um, these optional policies, okay? I heard some people say, um, well, we don't need all of them, we don't need some of them. And we have 18, we could have 38, we could have 100 of these optional policies. Um, but somebody could make a case that every one of these policies is needed. Although it may not have application to me or to you, I'm sure that we could find somebody out there who says, oh yeah, yeah, that we, we need that policy. We gotta have this one, we gotta have that one. Um, so when I looked at this, when I looked at all of this, I'm saying, well, okay, I wanna be sure that our children, our students are, are protected. And so I look at the ones that Cabe said Yes, you, these are the ones you have to have, okay? And as Mr. Salazar had said earlier, when I looked at those, and those are the ones that were being presented this evening, there are policies that protect against bullying and teen dating violence and sexual abuse and policies that protect our, our, our students from um, discrimination. They're there. They're already there and they're in place already and policies that cover dietary needs policies that um, cover security and safety within the school and and um, drug abuse and suicide prevention and all the, all the different issues that are facing our young people today, many, many of them, we have policies that are in place already, these 5,000 series that are in place already. They have issued this new block of 5,000 series that, that enhance it, that may, may um, broaden it. So um, to specifically address each and every potential situation that comes up, when it's likely, very likely, already addressed within the policies that we're bringing forward tonight, the policies that are in place already, that we have in place. Um, why stop at 18? Why not 28, 38? Um, if, if they're covered within what we have already. And, and that's, that's how I looked at it. I looked at it that, could that be found in, 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 in the non-discrimination policy that we have? Well, yes, that could be found in it. If, if our administration was faced with a situation that didn't have a specific policy that dealt with that situation, they would go to the policies that we do have to see where that situation would apply. If a person was discriminated against, then they would say, yes, we have a policy that addresses with discrimination already in place. And that's what we're gonna apply when we're, when we're dealing with this situation. The, f the fact is the subcommittee already approved these 18 policies in a previous incarnation. They've already been sent to the board and it was 4-4, so technically 4-4 fails it. Um, so at one point the subcommittee voted and agreed that these 18 policies should be included. That's why it's number 18. Uh, we're presented with hundreds of policies and right now the entire 5000 series as it lives today online, there's 37 of them. So we might get 100 suggestions and we pick the 37, for example, that make sense. So whoever sat in my seat before me, they decided that those 37 were of all the 5000s were the ones that made sense in Enfield. This summer, the 5000 series we're looking at this evening, plus 18 others made sense to the policy subcommittee. And now they don't. 
and I'm just saying I still believe because I voted yes before and I I still think these 18 should be included. We'd already whittled it down from 100 to 40. Ms. Hall, could Ms. LeBlanc speak? Certainly. Go ahead, Ms. LeBlanc. I just want to say that we have these subcommittees and the subcommittees are put together. The minority party gets one member and the majority party gets two. And in my opinion, a chair of that committee is almost there to bring both sides together. And from what I'm hearing tonight, and from what you're speculating, is this is gonna fail, and we're just gonna go in a big circle because I feel dismissed. And you guys have the numbers, and pretty soon you're gonna have another one to make this go through. But our concerns are not even being considered. Like, your mind was made up how this is gonna be handled, and in nine years, I have never seen a chair of a subcommittee make that decision. In nine years, we have never had so many issues coming out of the policy committee because that policy chair needs to take advice from senior members and other people and take into consideration. So basically, this policy committee is gonna go on, on the alternate, and this is how we're gonna operate for a year. There's not gonna be any me in the middle. There's not gonna be any I understand your concerns. This is how it was decided. This is effective. This is how I believe it. We're gonna we're headed for more lawsuits. Whatever. That's very unfair. That's very unfair. Is not bringing this board together. All the questions. All the question. Roll call. Mr. Salazar. Four. Mrs. Thurston. Hell no. Mr. Ungeyer. Yes. Oh. Mr. Ungar? Yes. Ms. Hall? No. Mr. LeBlanc? No. Mrs. LeBlanc? Absolutely not. Mr. Ryder? No. Okay, motion does not pass. Oh, Chairman Krizel, sorry. Abstain. Okay, motion still does not pass, thank you. Number 12, Board Committee Reports, Curriculum, Mr. LeBlanc. Mr. LeBlanc. What are we on again? Curriculum. Over, please. What? Curriculum? Curriculum. We do not have one. Um, our meeting's later this month. Finance will meet next Monday. Policy, Mr. Salazar. I had a question on finance. Oh, go ahead. Will you be able to chair on Monday? Yes, I will. Okay. We met at the last meeting and we finished the 5,000s. Obviously they were uh, rejected this evening and then uh, we'll reconsider again at our next meeting. Leadership, we have none. Joint facilities is meeting this Thursday. There's some final invoices for the uh, phase three Barnard roof to be approved. The chimney's almost done at Barnard, so that building should be complete. Um, JFK building committee met last uh, Thursday and it was uh, some some good information came up. They with the with the COVID, we got you know as you know we got good pricing for for stuff. We got a uh, three hundred thousand dollar credit on steel as a change order. So things are looking up, and, and construction is proceeding. And uh, you have a question, Miss Hall? You're, no, oh, I was okay. being excited at okay. getting a credit. It's, it's, hard to <laughs> it's hard to tell with these masks on. So <laughs> yes, <obviously>. it is. <laughs> Joint Security is meeting in January, I believe. Uh, December 2nd at 8.30. December, thank you. Joint Insurance is also meeting in December, I believe. So we move on to number 13, approval of minutes, regular Board of Ed meeting minutes, October 27th, 2020. Motion. 
Moved by Ms. LeBlanc, seconded by Ms. Thurston. Any discussion or changes? Yes, Ms. Hall. I have submitted changes on some of the statements I made to Kathy already, but I found another one on page six, the fourth paragraph down. I believe the word should be numbers, not NUM. I'm for sure she's watching, so she will make that change. So we'll we'll approve it as amended. Any other discussion? Move to favor? approve as amended. Yep. We have eight in favor, zero against. Hands up, Stace. Let's go, Stace. Approval of accounts and payroll, we have none. Communi uh, correspondence and communications. I will take one moment to wish a fellow board member a happy birthday tomorrow. You might be the youngest, <laughs> but. <laughs> He still admits to birthdays. Yeah, I just want to wish you a happy birthday. You still get student discounts. I remember the day he was born. Are you legal? Of course. Uh -huh. So enjoy your day tomorrow. And I don't know if we've ever talked about it, but he shares a birthday with my mom. So that's always oh. meant a lot to me. I was going to finish my comments now, but I, now I'll just refrain from them. Uh, need for executive session? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Ms. Second. By Ms. Thurston, seconded by Ms. Hall. Any discussion? Great meeting, guys. Thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? All in favor? Eight, eight in favor, zero against. Good night. Thank you, ETV, for your hard work.